Hello everybody and welcome back to another exciting episode of Neo Scavenger. Let's continue where we left off, which was out in the- Oh yeah, we were just on the outside of Detroit, which is where we're going to be heading here actually this episode. That was uh, what I wanted to do. So, without further ado, let's continue. Who knows how this is going to go for us. Navigating the twisty maze of shacks and tarp shelters, Detroit's massive walls stand as a constant backdrop to the east. Easily half a dozen stories high and probably almost as thick, the city walls are on are an umbrella. Alright, I hope you got that. Uh, the city walls are an impressive sight to behold. Armed towers, bristling with surveillance arrays, stand at regular intervals, keeping watch over the sprawl and likely the city within. Before you, giant vid screens on uh, three gatehouses flash instructions about pass requirements and threat levels as flocks of people stream into and out of the gates. You take your place in line on the right, with the others entering the city. When you reach the front of the line, a sinking feeling overcomes you. Heavily armed guards in full combat armor are checking attendees with some sort of scanning device. You're pretty sure that whatever these folks have, uh, you're missing it. When it's your turn, the guard stops you and turns to a monitor installed in the wall. A message reads, device not detected, entrance denied. With the efficiency and compassion of an assembly line worker, he directs you away from the line, back outside. Unfortunately, getting entrance to the city may be trickier than just showing up. Whoa, that face is new, and he's... Wow. Terrified. Jesus. Jesus. All right. Uh, oh, God, it's going to be read... Oh, I see a typo. Look how they spelt that side. Back out, he said. <laughs> Back outside, you cross the muddy square and stop to survey the area. Where do you go now? Would anyone in the sprawl know about the cryo facility? You're startled when you notice a man has been watching you. He's wearing a long brown coat and matching hat and leans on a walking stick. From this distance, you can almost see the, the glint of his eyes below the trilby's brim, although it's probably just your imagination. He takes his time to approach you. Uh, he takes his time approaching you, and as he nears, you notice there's a heavy mecalage on his face. That's a word I actually don't know. Interesting. It reminds you of one of those old portraits you'd see in a history textbook. Folks call me Hatter, he says matter-of-factly. I think we may, be able to, we may be able to help each other. Come with me. Hatter's office is in the husk of one of those flap, uh, flop hotels. Oh my god, I don't know what it is, and I apologize ahead of time. There is something about the way this text looks that makes it difficult for me to read. I don't know if it's because of the old retro-style look of the text, but it's bo it bothers me. Um... Hatter's office is in the husk of one of those flop house hotels you'd see crammed between high rises in a busy city. It even has the old marquee hanging precariously from the cornerstones. Several floors up, armed guards watch over the street and missing sections of the building. Hatter acknowledges the men at the door and leads you through a surprisingly clean lobby to an old-fashioned uh, old fashioned elevator. I have a client, he starts, pausing for the cage to rattle shut, who collects heirlooms. He speaks louder over the motor. He compensates well. Well enough, in fact, that I'd be willing to part with a DMC visitor's pass in exchange. The elevator clunks to a halt, and the door rattles open, revealing a dark room lit by video screens and old lamps. Stepping off the elevator, it feels like you've walked into a control center built into an antique store. Bobbles and relics crowd the walls and tabletops, while video screens and computer consoles cast a bluish tint on a handful of armed guards. Hatter crosses the room to sit at a low, broad desk facing the elevator. There's a lake. He pulls out a worn road atlas from a desk drawer. About a day's walk northwest of here. Inside a building there is a silver urn. He pages through the atlas of a map of Michigan. My guess is that you know a thing or two about getting around out there, and maybe this could be your ticket into the DMZ. He pauses to look up at you. Interested? Alright, so this guy who shows up just offers us a job to go find a silver urn, and in, in exchange, he will give us uh, the pass that we need to get into the city. We can either accept, deny, or, since we have trapping, say, it's a trap! Something doesn't add up. You're no seasoned mercenary, but you're sure any fixer worth his salt is really careful who he contracts for work. And a visitor's pass can't be cheap, so there's no way this is just a cakewalk test. Plus, had her approach you. Nobody walks into a town out of nowhere and gets that kind of welcome. Something something doesn't wash here, and it's making you edgy. I don't like this, you say, stopping short of sounding threatening. Sounds like someone's trying to set me up. That gets had his attention, and he looks at you. You hear the creak of leather as a guard tenses. Hmm, 
he says, leaning back in his creaking chair. Turns out maybe you are worth the extra attention you seem to have garnered. He looks down at a blank spot on his desk, considering something for a moment, and starts talking at it. Your, let's call him employer, had a particular, particular interest in you. He leans forward and starts interacting with the security console. Interested enough to open this earned contract with express instructions that only you be assigned, be assigned the contract. I read that wrong, oh well. Said I'd find you trying to enter the DMC. Said he'd, uh, front you the cost of the visitor's pass if I got you to do it. He finishes the keystroke, then gestures to the wall monitors. One of the monitors switches to a view of his room, with a cycling time code in the, cor in the uh, lower corner. After a few seconds of fast-forwarding, it switches to real-time playback. There, standing where you are now, a black mass about the size of a man talks with Hatter. The detail seems to be glitchy, as if there is some dark-colored static distorting the signal, but only around the figure. What's with the censoring, you ask? Dunno. Look normal in person. Must be some sort of EMF interference. The discussion is short, punctuated by the figure handing Hatter a small object, then leaving. As a rule, I don't disclose client info like this. He stops the video. But you seem like a decent type. More to the point, resourceful. And while money talks, I'll take a competent operative over cash any day. He reaches into a drawer and pulls out a small black wristband. The pass is yours. I'll keep my ear to the ground for any, any info on this Reaper fellow and let you know. And hey, he says before letting go of it, maybe you come around again when you're looking for some work. So he just gave us the pass that we can now wear. And now we can get inside. Excellent, excellent. Actually, I'm going to take this. Somebody said I should put the bag on my hand. Oh, yeah, extra storage. Perfect. So that actually ends our turn. We actually moved, as you can see, to wherever Hatter is. Um, I don't know if we can go. We're bleeding, apparently. We're really hurt. Um, I'm actually going to check something real quick. Do I have an extra shirt? Can I actually craft, like, clean bandages here? I need to, like, heal up a bit. So we put this here. And water. No. Let's put the water. Nope. Is there... I, I really want to just, like, do some, some cleaning. 70, 42. Say it's dirty rags. Well, let's go to medical, then. And see if we can heal up. Let's empty it out. Can we clean our wounds? We should clean them if we can. I'm trying to do what I can to, like, kind of stymie the, the problems that we're having. Um, but we can get into the city now, so that's good. Let's go ahead and start trying to go into the city. So that's the same thing as before. At the front of the line, the guard motions you closer. A moment of pregnant, pregnant silence proceeds to a satisfying chirp and the monitor flashes. Is. Visitor pass N6MAA10816 authorized. The guard ushers you forward and you begin down a longish stretch of empty corridor lined with harsh xenon lighting. Beyond the opening at the other end, you see throngs of activity and the flicker of busy signage eclipsed by passing people. All right, here we are. So, this is a city, a little bit different of a map area than, say, what was before. But we have a bunch of places we can go. We can go to the Red Gnome, we can go to Detroit Savings Bank, Haggerty Health Clinic, which we could use to get healed up a bit, and Concrete Forest Apartments. Lots of lights kind of flickering around. I really like this kind of top-down look. It's obviously very basic, but it gets the point across. Um, so let's go ahead and go to... We have 4.99 on our hand. How about have the Haggerty Health Clinic? See if we can get healed up and see if the, how much it'll cost. Haggerty Health Clinic is a pretty busy spot. Its proximity to Gate 11 and its mercenary attitude toward clientele ensures that it has a steady stream of business from both inside the DMC and Sprawl. The Double H, as it's often called, offers a wide spectrum of health services. Those include diagnostics, cleaning and dressing of wounds, therapeutic, including nanorobotic suspension treatments and prescription drugs. There's also on-site augmentation clinic where patients can elect for prosthetic enhancements. These highly desired services may require special permits in addition to the significant price tags. Uh, let's see what we can get in here. Inside the lobby looks a lot like any other clinic. There are banks of attachment seats covering the floors. Da 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 da. All right. Blood transfusion, broad base nano robotic suspension treatment. Clean and dress wounds, $376. Core body temperature, prosthetics, rehydration. 
Dear lord, man, these guys are expensive! Let's go upstairs. Alright. Eye augmentation. These are actually surprisingly cheap. Eye surgery. Artificial eye replacement. Oh my god. Okay. Well, I could do this better out in the world, so I'm gonna leave this place. F that. So we should be able to come and go as we please now. Um, let's see if we have a bank. Let's go to the bank and let's see if there's any money we can draw out. Maybe we have an old bank account. Detroit Savings Bank turns out to be surprisingly tricky business to find. As a presence for certain, self-service terminals are near ubiquitous, winking at passers from countertops, ad walls, alcoves, but there's little more to these terminals than signage lights on the screen. There doesn't even appear to be a place to dispense cash nor insert a card. After a bit of walking though, you eventually find a Detroit Savings Bank micro branch with more than a screen. Uh, you're outside the Detroit Savings Bank gate 11 micro branch secure climate blah blah blah. Threaten teller, enter the booth, wait for the teller to leave. Let's go, let's enter the booth. You pull the transparent door, step through inside, and you're greeted with the bright color blah blah blah. Alright. Ask about Geige's cryo facility account. Yeah, yeah, let's see if we can find anything about who we are and what happened. Is there anything with that can assist you with? You begin to explaining your situation starting with the cryo facility, your amnesia, and the clues you follow to reach this point. She feigns interest as you tell her your tale, but at the first opportunity interjects. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Kindred, but do you hold an account with us? I think so. You consider answering, but she continues, or perhaps you have some form of identification. Show her your bracelet. Uh, you hold forward your bracelet, pl uh, plaintively. Oh, she says, switching subtly from attentive to deflective. I'm, afri I'm afraid we can only accept service clients who presently hold an account with Detroit Savings Bank or citizens of Detroit opening new accounts. However, you're still welcome to use our payment network and any participating vendor. Your mobile device can both send and receive payments. She indicates a brightly illustrated placard on the wall depicting an overwhelmingly inoffensive young people conducting transactions in unnaturally happy fashion. You smile and thank the lady. So we don't have anything we can do. So let's see, we'll wait for her to leave. I can threaten her, but I have like, what am I gonna do, hit her with my crowbar? You find a position with good vantage point and stare at the booth like a psycho for a while. Fortunately, it appears something has come up and it doesn't involve calling the police on a stalker. The teller gathers some things, exits the booth, and locks behind her. You're outside the DSB gate 11 micro branch now, emptied and locked. Now we can wait for her to return and log in. Several minutes later, the teller walks back up to the booth and unlocks the door. She spreads a few personal effects on her desk and draws the keyboard near. We can watch the teller log in. Zoom, watch teller log in with optical. Yeah, let's do it with the optical login. Because I don't know. Yeah, we'll do it with the optical zoom. When the login screen appears, the teller rattles off some keystrokes and it's almost too quick to discern. However, you think you have it down to a couple possible permutations. It should be it should be few enough to try to manually uh, without a lockout. Now to get your mitts on that keyboard. We'll wait for her to leave. Uh, you find a position with a good vantage point and stare at it like uh, as soreness overcomes your feet, you realize this is going to take longer than you thought. You're outside the Detroit Savings Bank Gate 11, a secure climate-controlled booth, slightly larger. Can we try again? Let's just leave for now. We'll come back. So we should be good enough. Now, we can't go to the core city. I don't think it's actually part of the game. Um, we need to we need to sleep or something. Can we go to, like, an apartment? I'm curious. Arriving at a concrete forest apartment, you immediately see the resemblance. Towering structures, da 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 Blows of the organic patch of community gardens and trash heaps. Gutted husks of cars and playgrounds. Those who call the forest home and those who sleep in its shadow. Feels a bit like a street fair collided with a refugee camp and ghetto. You step into the block and start looking around. Check out the canteen truck. There's a, wait, there's a canteen truck strategically positioned curbside near the main walk. People are lined up at the illuminated side window and a mixture of steam and smoke stream from its openings. Nearby, music booms from where a crowd is gathered. It's all bobbing shoulders and legs from here, but you can see a car's hatchback sticking from a corner center. One of the towers has a sea store at ground level. A lonely few are inside, but it doesn't seem very popular, and there's a ubiquitous knockoff vendor barking at passersby. So I can check out the crowd, leave them, leave the apartments, check out the sea store, or check out the canteen truck. I don't have money for the canteen truck, so let's check out the crowd. The sidewalk is vibrating with a bass as you approach, and the scene begins to make a bit more sense. A wide body metallic red hatchback is parked near the center, its doors and a hatch wide open to expose an array of lights, speakers, and subs. You can almost feel the air move in time with the beat. 
Meanwhile, B-boys are taking turns, mixing moves with, and styles with familiar and strange. It astounds you how the human body can do these things, how humans still push the boundaries of an art from older to, than you can imagine. The high positive energy feels so foreign after days in the wild. Everything out there seems to be forgotten in this hot bath of sound and energy. You stick around for a few moments, soaking up a raw culture, then turn back to the matters at hand. So let's check out the, the, the thing, I guess. We can get in line. Well, we don't have money, so let's, that's pointless. Let's go ahead and check out the sea store. We can start shopping. Uh, yep, so we can purchase and sell here. Oh, man. This is beautiful. What can I sell here? This is worth $80, a sleeping bag? That's insane. If I had a spare sleeping bag, that'd be great. Unfortunately, I do not. How much are they selling? 11 bucks, 11 bucks. This is great. We have to come back here at some point. 50 cents for just a straight up bag. $1.25 for pills? That's all I'm getting for these? Yet they sell them for like 300 at the other place. Oh, maybe they're because they're empty. Yeah, it must be because they're empty because we have these. Well, you know what? Let's actually sell one of our... Let's actually sell one of our pill bottles. Does he not have enough? Well, maybe another day time. Alright, well, that was fun. And that's that. Alright, well, nothing here, really. So we're going to leave, I guess, for now. We could go... Really nowhere. I feel like we're going to need to go back in the wild for a little bit. The Red Gnome, I know what this is. like a tavern restaurant thing. Not much I can do here. Let's go back to the savings bank and see if we can get in. Oh, we have to do this whole thing again? Uh, so now we have to wait for her to leave. So let's see if we can actually do this. Do we have to just keep doing this again and again and again? Like, I don't understand. Can I just go in? Nope. I can threaten her. I don't think anything's happening. Aha! You find a good position. Fortunately, it appears that something has come up. Alright, she finally left. Wait, what? Let's do this again? Well, let's threaten her. Let's try it. Screw delicacy, let's get this done. You step into the booth and stride towards her. Uh, she is visibly surprised at your brazenness and stammers. You march around the desk and tell her to get lost, staring at her as she scrambles to get away from you. She steps outside and hurries away, rummaging through her purse. Search the terminal. You find a query tool and locate the account ID field. Recalling the ID from the cryo computer, you key in the digits and hit enter. You hazard a look outside and bystanders have started rubbernecking. On screen, a turning hourglass seems to mock you as you faint sounds of sirens echoing off... Oh, we gotta hurry up, man. Uh, come on. Let's see. Search results finally appear, and you click on the loan entry. Better banking, checking account, um, McHale, McAllen, Kale. Concrete Forest Apartments, number 3935, Tower 48, Detroit, blah, 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 balance zero dollars. Heh. Well, that probably explains why your cryo visit came to such an abrupt stop. Oh, I ran out of money. Sirens blare suddenly in the streets in a high, warbling burst. Blue and red strobes light up the area as fan jets uh, scatter moisture debris around. Oh, God. A loudspeaker booms. Oh, Jesus. This is Skycorp security. Step into the street and place your hands on top of your head. Run away from the sky bike. Comply. Run! You, see, you steal your nerves and bolt, veering left immediately. A flash of red emits from the sky bike's underbridge, and your body is painted in a flickering crosshatch pattern. You hear a beep followed by a loud pow. Something slams into you and you collapse instantly, muscles seizing uncontrollably. Unable to see, move, or even hear straight, the world is agonizing blur as you flop to the asphalt. Moments later, an armored multi-wheeled personnel carrier appears bearing the same colors and flashing lights as a Skycore bike. Bulky silhouettes emerge from the APC's glaring lights. They're shaped to find by heavy riot gear. They approach you, bind your hands, and half escort, half carry you to the ramp of the APC's building. All the while, the red beam from the Skycore bike traces your moves, only shutting off as you pass through the bulkhead. Inside, you're stripped of anything useful and strapped into a restraining seat. The guards then step through another bulkhead and climb a step or two before sealing you in. 
You're left there, sitting in your restraints, looking around a reinforced room with windows. The sound of duck fans can be heard, but little else. Nothing seems to happen for an annoyingly long time, and then the APC begins moving. The acceleration is surprisingly subtle for such a big machine, though the ride is still pretty rough back here. When your ride comes to an end, the interior bulkhead opens again, and the guards emerge to unfasten you. You're led to an exterior doorway, which blinds you when opened. The sounds of the city spill in through the door along the damp exterior air. You're guided down a ramp, and just as your eyes begin to adjust, you're dropped into a seat. Inside, under pale lighting, you're made to wait in restraints for hours. Drab cubicles divide most of the floor, and stern-looking operatives variously uh, interview de detainees, check computers, and disappear into other cubicles. Your eyes mine every detail of the room, looking for anything interesting to settle on. White foam ceiling tiles, beige, beige filing cabinets, black inbox outbox trays, pine desktops. It's so sterile that it actually incites frustration. Hope helpfully, informational posters and propaganda seem to be hung on a display to add a splash of color. DMC Perimeter Services, we care, and contraband, it hurts all of us. The missing person's touchscreen was good for about an hour, but you've memorized all the faces by now. Oh man, all right. By the time your case handler arrives, you've uh, counted the ceiling tiles and grouped them into shades of beige and created an elaborate conspiracy linking all the missing persons. Your handler leads you to his cubicle and you're subjected to a battery of tests, including face scan, retinal scan, DNA sampling, fingerprinting, and a blood sample. The interview is something of a comedy with questions like, what is your full name, address, and date of birth? And when asked where you obtained the forged pass, you would answer and received less than enthusiastically. You're escorted from the interview area and brought into an on-site clinic where you're strapped to a table and anesthetized. When you wake, you're on a bench in a painted cinder block room, leaning against a corner. Both your head and right shoulder ache. A pierce bleep fills the room as an intercom comes to life. You've been charged as follows. First degree criminal trespassing. Unauthorized access to a computer with intent to commit offense. Fraud and misuse of visas. Conspiracy to defraud the city of Detroit. Consorting with a known felon. Failure to disclose personal information. Oh, God. That, that's a little rough. The voice continues. You are hereby discharged from DMC Gate 11, marked and exiled. Oh, God. For a period of one year. Failure to comply the sentence is caused for a appended term of exile not to exceed two years per infraction. A door on the opposite wall buzzes and swings open, blinding you temporarily with the light from outside. When your eyes finally adjust, you see the cold, muddy streets of the DMC walls and the huddling throngs of sprawl inhabitants going about their business. And we got kicked out of the city for a year. Welcome back to the wild. Well, that's sure an episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, come back tomorrow for some more Daily Neo Scavenger. Consider leaving a like. It sure helps me a lot. And as always, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.